Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Williams, and you are listening to Retail Redeveloped. I'm so excited today uh, for a couple reasons. I am being joined by one Aaron Gadiel. Uh, now, Aaron is a pop-up expert uh, and just an overall marketing kind of guru that, that I've known for a long time. So I'm very excited to share his thoughts, opinions, and views on kind of the pop-up space with you guys. But more than that, Aaron and I have, have known each other for a long time and, and don't live in the same market. And this is, this is as much anything, just a chance for us to catch up and talk retail and talk pop-ups like we used to. And, and uh, you guys are the beneficiaries of that. Now, the Gadiel Group, which is Aaron's company, is a full-service commercial real estate consultant, consulting and brokerage agency focused on delivering ancillary revenue generation and consumer engagement tactics to their clients in the shifting paradigm of brick-and-mortar real estate. Aaron, that was a mouthful. I need you to come in and, uh, <laughs> and, and help everybody out and understand what it is that you do and, and why you left a, a cushy marketing job with a massive company to, to jump, uh, jump full steam ahead into this new venture. Yeah, cool. Uh, great, great talking to you, Adam. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, yeah, it is, a, it is a mouthful. Probably should uh, uh, clean that up a little bit. But, but really, it, 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 is, it says everything I wanted to say. Um, and, you know, I think there's some key points to that. The, the first one really being, it's a shifting retail landscape. I don't think there's any, any argument about that. I think everybody is experiencing that on some, on some level whether it's e-commerce, direct-to-consumer brands coming in and stealing people's lunches, uh, you know, uh, department stores closing, um, you know, the B and C, uh, you know, um, level retail just not performing as well. And so, you know, the way that business has been done for so long um, is changing. And, and at light speed. The, I, you know, yeah, yeah, at light speed, exactly. And it, and it came on quick. And a lot of, a lot of, I would say a lot of landlords are still trying to figure out how to, how to catch up and how to, how to, how to participate because, you know, they, they've been, somebody, you know, sort of moved their cheese as the expression goes as like, you know, that all of a sudden they've been doing business a certain way, you know, signing, you know, you know, 10 year leases with, uh, with, you know, great credit tenants. And all of a sudden those great credit tenants are gone and, and tenants are coming in saying, well, we, we'd, we'd like a 10 day lease or, or a, or a 10 week lease. And, and no, we're not going to put up any security, but if it works, then we'll, then we'll come in and, and uh, we'll sign a longer term lease, but we'll know what the rent should be because we've already been here. So, um, so I, I just really, I saw, you know, I, I, I literally experienced the landscape shifting, um, for the last, I don't know, 15 years. Um, I had a, I had a front row seat. I was, the director of leasing uh, for a lifestyle center uh, in suburban Chicago that, um, you know, was coming online in, in the late 2000s. And um, um, we, uh, you know, we opened the same week that Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. And, um, there, you know, all the tenants stopped doing business. And I was the director of leasing. And my boss looked at me at the time and he said, all right, well, there's no more leasing to be done because no one's got any money. Aaron, you're in charge of marketing now. And I said, well, I, I don't know how to market a shopping center. And he said, yeah, you do. Just get people to show up. And so I said, well, I know how to do that. I'm a, I'm a promoter at heart and promoting concerts and, and movie screenings and all kinds of stuff, you know, as a hobby for years. And so I said, well, why don't we just start doing that at a shopping center level? And lo and behold, uh, that's exactly what I started doing. And people started showing up for those kinds of things. They weren't coming for the shopping. Because, you know, frankly, you could, you could go to the, a lot of the stores everywhere, but they were coming for these experiences. And I, and I really saw that as, as sort of the first leg of the stool. Um, the second leg of the stool, I think, uh, which was really important, was um, there was the, the, the cottage industry, if you will, the people uh, doing business in their garages, uh, you know, whether it was like making, you know, frames or knitting, you know, sweaters and saying, yeah, you know what, I, I think I can... I think I can make a go of this. And of course the internet came online and they started selling their goods and said, wow, people are buying this. And, and oh, maybe I should have a store, but I don't want to sign a, a lease. 
And, you know, a full lease, I don't even know what a lease is. And so, um, so I started, you know, I mean, and, and we all know about, you know, pop-up stores, you know, we used, you know, uh, the Halloween store is probably the, the best example of a pop-up store, right? They've got those everywhere. But, but the new, the new uh, age of pop-up stores are these highly curated, um, you know, more um, attractive and engaging types of experiences. And so, really, in my role as the director of leasing, I had a bunch of vacant space to fill, and we even had some some space that we had built out, and so it was, you know, it was just sort of sitting there, and it was a necessity thing where I said, well, let's just put people in there and see what happens, and like, let's try to incubate some tenants, and and if it works, great, if it doesn't work, whatever, like, you know, and, and sure enough, we, we put some people in business, um, and, you know, they said, yeah, I'll try it out for a month. And then a month became two months and two months became six months, six months became a year. And then they said, all right, well, this is working. And now we know what we can spend. And so let's sign a three-year lease. And so really like incubating these tenants. So I saw this whole landscape, you know, literally occurring in real time. Um, obviously the rise of the internet changed everything when it comes to retail. And, um, and so it really, I, I, I've been in, in and I, I appreciate you, you mentioned my cushy marketing job. Um, sometimes, some days I didn't feel it was so cushy, but, uh, but it was really that like, was definitely an inside you know, so, joke between the two of us. There was nothing cushy about, yeah. about that, that job. <laughs> but, you know, but I, I mean, I experienced it and, and the stuff that I was doing in my market in Chicago and the company I worked for said, Hey, can you come help us in Charlotte? Can you come help us in LA and Oakland? And I realized that the, the, the things that I was doing, you know, here in Chicago, they, they, they literally, they you could do the same thing in Charlotte, of course, perfectly, you know? So, um, so, oh, well, wait a minute. And, and I, and then the, the real big shift for me was when I had other, um, uh, other landlords, companies calling me saying, Hey, we love what you're doing. Can you come help us? And I said, wow, wait a minute. There's, there's a real need here because, you know, I know how to be a broker and, and Adam, you're, you're a phenomenal broker, but this kind of world, this pop-up world, this changing, this is a different, there's a lot of handholding that goes on. There's, um, you know, it's there's a, totally a lot of education. Beast. It's a totally different beast. And by the way, that's for both the tenant, the tenant and the landlord. And so one of the things I like to say a lot is I speak fluent landlord. Um, and, and what I mean by that is I can, I can talk the language of a landlord that says, listen, the way, you know, we need to fill these spaces and, you know, and listen, I, I'm the first guy to know about permanent leasing, but there's a different path to get there than there have ever has been before. And so I just kind of watched it all happen unfold in front of me and saw a market opportunity and said, you know what, I think my skills can apply to uh, a larger audience. And so I, I struck out on my own as the uh, chief dot connector, as I like to say. So it, it, it really brings me... Uh, to a couple different things that I want to talk about. A, a, a couple things that you said that kind of stuck with me. One is variety. I mean, when, when you're doing these pop-ups, like it, it seems to me, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that it gives people more reasons to to come out, right? Like it, like if, if I if I have a strip center down the street or a mall down the street. And I know that it has the same 20 stores in there. It's, it had the same 20 stores last year. It had the same 20 stores a year and a half or, you know, 18 of the 20 stores. Um, if there was some kind of rotating pop-up program that was well curated, it would give me a reason to, you know, put my laptop down, shut down Amazon and come down there and see, see what's going on. Uh, much in the same way that the food hall model kind of, kind of really is attractive to people because you know, good food halls, they don't want the same 20 stalls there for five years, right? They want that attrition. They want, yeah. they want to be able to plug different people in there to keep it fresh. So um, I assume yep. that that is something that you can offer to a landlord that would be hard to get through a traditional, you know, 10 year and two, five year option leasing structure. Yeah. I mean, now you're hitting it on the head. I mean, what I like to say is you can't sell shopping anymore, right? The days of like, Oh, we have the best shopping is gone because you don't have the best shopping because every human being or, you know, certainly a huge proportion, you know, huge portion of them have 
have the largest shopping center in the world in, in the world on their phone, and I can get anything delivered to my door in an hour. I don't have to leave my house. And so, so what's going to to your point? What is going to get me to put down the phone, to turn off the computer, and get up and go? If I know, and 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 what it is is, and this is where pop ups and these unique experiences. I can only get this particular thing. I can only see this particular product or do this particular experience in this location. Then I have to go there. And it's my belief that people, um, because of the sort of the, the incredible connection with technology, people are also disconnected, um, you know, personally in real life and people crave that personal connection. And that is where, the shopping centers and the, and the, and the, the retail centers that are thriving are winning and um, is, is creating opportunities for people to connect in real life, IRL, as the kids like to say. Um, Wait, that's a thing. And, and yeah, pop- I, I, I can't keep up. I can't keep up with all the things. I, IRL, baby. IRL in real life. That all is right. a thing. I'm going to write that um, down. Right? And, and, and if you think about it, it makes sense. It's like, you know, hey, we're, we're great friends on Facebook but we've never met in real life. I'm not saying right. you and I, but like, you know, you have, you have people, you know, that you're like, Oh no, he's a great friend of mine. Have you ever met him? No, no, no. We're friends on Facebook, you know? Well, so that's where <clears throat> real life experiences, um, really are, 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 are just growing and pop-ups are a major piece of that. And exactly to your point, if it's the same stores that have been there for 20 years, it's tired tired, man. People are looking for variety. And I think you hit it. I love your point about the food halls because I totally agree. That's what it is. It's it, the, the food hall is the new food court, right? You put food hall on it and all of a sudden it's yep. like a fancy food court. Yep. But the key to that and what we're going to, and what I think the ones that are going to really thrive are the ones that change up their lineups every, every so often. And, That's and, really where it's going to get exciting. And the other thing that you mentioned that grabbed me, Um, Frank Romano did a development in Dallas called Trinity Grove, I believe is, is, is the name. And it was the first food hall that really caught my eye because he did an incredible job at curation uh, because he knew so much about uh, restaurants and he basically set these people up in business. And if they worked really well, he would help them expand and keep a piece of, exactly. of, of, of the pie. So I love the incubation uh, kind yeah. of angle of pop-ups as well. Like you said, you know, you think you make the best, you know, basket weaving, you know, straw baskets in the world. You know, let's see if people actually want to buy them. Um, and, and I think that obviously not everybody's going to make it, but, but for every, I'm, I'd love to know the the metric of one out of every X of these pop ups actually actually gets legs. That would that would be really really interesting data. I mean, I, I I'll be honest with you. At, at the centers that I've worked on, I've seen it being close to fifty percent. Fifty percent. Grid. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some now some pop ups some pop ups aren't designed to be long term tenants. They're literally. Here today, gone tomorrow, that's the whole model. But some, and this is where I start, you know, I, I, what I believe, what I call feasibility studies. And it's a term I learned. I was at a conference and some guy said, I think pop-ups are feasibility studies. And I just love that. I was right. like, that's genius. I get that. That's what it is. That, right. That's what it is. And, and what, I, what I really think happened with the whole pop-up game and where retail is that there's a term in, 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 in the tech world, uh, which is fail fast, right? Which is right, absolutely. go a hundred miles an hour, but if it doesn't work, get out as quickly as possible. And, and the model in retail was, was not that the model in retail was like sign a 10 year lease, die on the vine and buckle <laughs> and buckle and die on the vine. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so what happened and, and certainly with the direct consumer brands being like, Oh no, we're a tech company, you know, Oh, you want us to get into brick and mortar retail? All right, well, we're just going to do the same thing. If this works, we're in. But if it doesn't work, we're out. And and that's the part that hasn't. And so this fail fast in the retail world, I think, is the new. That's sort of the new paradigm that the re, that the tenants are coming in with. And the, and to be honest with the landlords, and some are better than others, but but a lot of landlords are still like, nope, nope, we're holding out. And I'm like, all right, well, good luck, you know. I've said this on other podcasts, uh, this, this kind of 
shift in power reminds me a lot yeah. of record labels like the day before mm. Napster, right? Like back mm-hmm. then it was mm-hmm. like, hey man, if you want if you want to be on the radio, sign this piece of paper, you know, working for MCA kind of kind of vibe. Um, and like we're going to take we're, we're going to be the first to get paid, you're going to be the last to get paid. You know, post Napster now when anybody with a SoundCloud account can can get the word out, you know, that 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 paradigm has shifted drastically and given a lot more power right. to the to the artist and and you know, I, I think this is happen. This is an example of that happening as well. That said, I'm a landlord guy. Like I do a tremendous amount of landlord yeah. work, and we're still doing a lot of of leases. But it's just it's a very it's a very humbling thing for you know a, a mall owner that has you know has a massive um, you know set of properties ac- across the entire country. I mean, I, I'm sure that they've they've had an attitude change here, uh, big time. So. I, w- I want to shift yeah, a little just, bit. Uh, go ahead. Uh huh. No, I was going to say, I, 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 what I'm actually seeing is it's the mall owners, the big mall owners, the Simons, the Brookfield GGPs, Mace Rich. They're the ones that have embraced, I think, the pop up trend as big as anyone. Mace Rich, they, they, Mace Rich is making whole stores around it. I, I interviewed yep. their, their head of uh, yep. technology and. And yep. it was unbelievable how proactive yep. they were in some of their best malls to say, okay, let's, let's get a case study on this. It makes, it makes a ton of sense. Oh yeah. Brand box, I believe oh, is Mace yeah. Rich's version. It was, it was phenomenal to hear, to hear yep. how they were thinking about it. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, God bless those guys because they can put a team of, you know, 20 people on it. Um, there, just focus on this from now on, you know, it's sort of like, it really, you know, some people ask me like, well, I don't understand. I said, well, just think of it as like the new age of specialty leasing, right? So instead of, you know, there's still kiosks, right? There's still like RMUs, but like now it's the next evolution of that, you know? And, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I get that. You know? And, and, you know, when I talked to a landlord, a uh, major mall owner who said, oh yeah, well, when we started this business, the specialty leasing side, was $150,000 a year. And when we sold it, the, the company, it was $15 million a year. It didn't, you know, doesn't take a genius to figure out like, Oh, this is real. You know, yeah, it's real. Need so. to pay attention to this. Um, so I'm going to shift a little bit to, uh, I would consider this a pop-up, but, I, but honestly, I want to get your opinion on it. The sales as a service platforms that are starting to pop up. When I was in Manhattan, um, a, a little while back, I interviewed, one of the guys from Beta, I went into Showfields, yep. I went into Naked, yep. and yep. was just like a kid in a candy store. It was it was a phenomenal experience to see how yep. brands are now willing to these digitally native brands that whole lives um, are are on the internet, kind of like the, the the people that we were talking about earlier having having a million Facebook friends. And, you know, there's certain products that just don't naturally translate over a web, a web page, right? The one that, that really stuck out was Theragun, right? Which is like the percussion massager. They're, they're three or 400 bucks and seeing somebody use one is a lot different than feeling kind of how powerful they are. Right. And to be able to walk into a store and a super low pressure salesman's like, Hey man, I don't care if you buy this thing or not that's really not why we're here i'm here to explain to you why this is a cool product and and here yeah. like read the read the brand message read why they created this read you know get some details and 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 that kind of struck me as as like a pop-up on steroids or a pop-up with like a tech infusion right like a yeah like a like a cool startup mentality i'd love to get your take on on that do you think that's like a little flash in the pan or do you think that's going to be the new normal in 10 years no i think that is 100 percent the new normal and and here's where i where i what i actually think that those stories are and i love beta and i love showfield um and there's several other ones so if you think about it isn't that just what we used to call a department store absolutely you know right like that's just like an, the new like an unbloated store. mix of yeah. a brookstone yeah. and a department store is what i, I exactly. kind of geeked out about and so Right. No, exactly. And so, right. Or, or right. Brookstone's a great, great example or Hammaker Schlemmer with a store in Chicago. I'm not going to add those anywhere else, but, um, but you know, and, and it's it, the, the, really the way those stores, what I, what I love about them is what, what was the product you just named? Theragun? 
Theragun. Yeah, it's like a it's a yeah. it's a percussion percussion massager. Uh, right. A buddy of mine right. had one when we were skiing, and it, it it's a it's a game changer if you yeah. if, if you get sore. Yeah, yeah, and so incredible product, right? Incredible story behind it. They don't need a whole store; they need a shelf, right? You know, and by the way, they barely need a shelf. You know, what yeah, I mean? it's like, like two foot by and two foot with an iPad, and yeah, a, yeah it's crazy. But really, and they don't slick, need inventory. Yep. Yes, of course, they don't need inventory. You don't need to sell anything there because you're buying it online, and you'll have it in your hands in, in a day or two. So it's you know, and I I think I think they're genius. Actually, I think Showfield is a brilliant concept, um, um, and uh, I, I really like Beta. Um, I like that one a lot. Um, I, I just neighborhood goods it, it is very makes, cool too. Neighborhood goods is coming on strong. Obviously, the guys out of Texas are no dummies. Uh, the open realty guy. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a lot, and I, even even to the point of like a Warby Parker or a Bonobos um, or Outdoor Voices, which you know, and some of those, you know, Bonobos. I think they just recently you could just start walking out of the store with a product, but before that. That wasn't possible. You know, Warby Parker, you know, you could go in, you could buy a pair of sunglasses, but for the most part, their showrooms is really all it is. It's a showroom of their product. You pick out what you want. Okay, you'll have it in a day or two. Um, and I, I absolutely believe that's the wave of the future. I mean, I just, especially as, you know, retail rent, like if you're paying retail rent uh, and you need, I need, all right, I need a 5,000 square foot space, but only 2,500 of that is actually showroom space that I'm going to be making money. And the other 2,500, which I have to pay retail rent on, is just warehouse space. Wait a minute. This, this model doesn't make sense. You know, um, and you're seeing it in restaurants, you know, with these ghost kitchens popping up. They're saying, wait a minute. Why do I, stre- why do I, pay- why am I paying full rent on, you know, you know, when I just need, and it's stressing out the kitchen that's serving the restaurant let's just go build a, another kitchen for, you know, for five bucks a square foot um, instead of 35 bucks a square foot. And let's go serve out of that. So I think this trend is, you know, is absolutely here to stay. And, and again, I think it's the next wave. It's, you know, we used to call them department stores and, and now we're calling it beta and, you know, whatever. So how do you go in? Because again, we're talking about legacy landlords that are used to kind of ruling the roost how how has your experience been going into them and, and pitching what to people that aren't kind of total nerds about this stuff like like you and I like <laughs> how, how do you go in yeah. and pitch this to these landlords have you been laughed out of meetings or do people get it like walk me through you know how these conversations go yeah that's a great question I have been laughed out of meetings um and uh and that's you know um and that's fine. Um, you know, uh, but I think what's happening is it, it's und- it's becoming undeniable, you know, where I think for a few years we were like, Oh, these pop-ups, that's just a trend, you know, it's a fad, they're going to wear off. And then it didn't wear off. And then there's more pop-ups and then, you know, and then there's space, you know, and then the people not doing it are like, well, we still have this vacant space and we can't lease it. And, and the days of, you know, putting up a sign and making a bunch of cold calls. Like, I'm not saying it doesn't work and we do it and I do it. I'm a broker, you're a broker, you know, we do what we have to do, but you have, you know, I, I really believe you have to get a little bit more creative with the leasing efforts. And ultimately, and I, and I mean this, and I have said this all, all the time, marketing and the pop-up stores, it, it is tail wagging the dog, right? The, the goal of, any shopping center, any retail project is permanent leasing. That's how these things get financed. That's how, you know, that's how you realize, you know, your, your asset value, you know, your equity in the property. So pop-ups are just a means to that end. And that's how I have the conversation with the landlord, which is don't stop leasing. You know, we're not, we're not stopping the permanent leasing. In fact, like it's only going to get better because you're going to give people a different vision and people, uh, people look at a different space. I, you know, I can't tell you how many times I would do a pop-up, a, a space would be vacant for years and I do a pop-up in there and all of a sudden a permanent tenant would come in. Oh, we want it. Well, where were you? You know, what, what do you mean? Now you want it? You know, like what happened? And what happened was 
people could see it in action. Energy, and life. so energy, live, the lights are on, there's people inside. Oh, wait a minute. That's not a dead spot in the mall. That's actually a pretty good spot. You know, oh, wait a minute. Look, you know, and, and where I, um, what I like to tell landlords is this is, this is air cover for your leasing brokers. You know, and I talk to, I talk to a lot of brokers who are like, well, I don't know. I don't want to do pop-ups. And I'm like, listen, you don't have to, let me do the pop-ups. You keep doing the permanent leasing, but let me give you the air cover you need. So now you're doing, you've got your sign, you've got your cold calling, right? You're doing all the normal stuff and we're trying these new things. Um, you know, and so that's what I talk to landlords about is like, I'm not saying this is going to change the whole world, but it's it is another a new, tool in the toolbox. New, there you go. It's another tool. Why, why not use it? And yes, there's an invest. That's for me, the biggest challenge for landlords. And, and I don't think this is, you know, we, you know, you and I were talking about this earlier. It's like the paradigm has shifted from, it's not just brokerage anymore. You, there is a consultancy to it. And because of that, there's an investment that has to get made. And that's where the challenge is. The landlord says, well, why should I invest in this? You know, I'll just wait for it to be leased. It's like, well, you know, sometimes you have to spend a little bit of money to make a lot and of it's money. it's opportunity cost. Um, I mean, my goodness. I mean, I, vacant space is not free by any stretch. That's right. That's right. And, and you never know. I did a, uh, I'll tell you a cool story. So I created a program called Search for the Next Great Pop-Up, right? Sort of a kitschy, fun you know, like, you know, sort of reality TV-ish kind of thing. Search for the next great pop I've actually always wanted to make a reality show out of it. And I think you would be a I've lovely, an... lovely movie star. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I, so I've run this, I've run this, I've run this in Chicago. I've run it in LA, but I ran it in, in, in a, in a old school, like 1950s, um, like literally like brick, you know, <laughs> brick mall, um, that was redesigning their food court in, into a food hall, right? And, but yet they were still doing, you know, they still had Panda Express and they still had, you know, some, some normal food court. But I suggested, I said, let's do this and let's create this contest and we'll give away a spot in the food hall. We'll give away a stall. And I got so much pushback about, we can't build it out you know, it costs too much money. And I, you know, and my pitch is like, listen, you're going to build it out anyway, you know, but you were just doing it in advance and we're creating this whole marketing energy play around it. Well, thankfully I had some supporters behind me and we built it out and it wasn't cheap. I mean, it might've cost, I don't know, $250,000 to build out this food stall, you know, and there was a lot of arguments. Well, how are we going to know where people are going to want the hood and the, and the, and the pipes. And I was like, listen, it doesn't matter. That's where they are. You know? So, um, so we, anyway, we, we, we built out the space and we ran this contest search for the next great pop-up and we entered, you know, people could enter and we got like five or I mean, eight or 10 different entries. And the eventual, the, the, the eventual winner was this taco stand, Ollie's tacos. And Ollie was, was a daughter, a, 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 a mother and a daughter team cooking like old school, totally authentic tacos. They had yes. been operating out of the back. They had been operating out of the back of a liquor store somewhere in town, probably, you know, you know, but they had a following and they were, and so we loved them and we brought them in and, um, and Ollie's tacos opened up in, uh, in, in the mall at Montclair place in Montclair, California. And wouldn't you know it, Ollie's tacos went bananas. <laughs> I mean, people couldn't believe that a taco place like this, you know, would open in the mall and literally. And so the deal with the winning of contest was you got a free space in this mall. You got the free space for six weeks. Well, three weeks into this, into their stay, they came to us and they said, uh, we'll take the next three weeks, but then we want to stay. And I believe that Ollie's tacos did about a million dollars in business in their first year. That's and amazing. became a became a full rent paying tenant. I think they were talking about opening up another stall next door, right? And so, it it works. I mean, the the the, the model works if you work it, if you allow it to work. And it it takes some vision, it takes some you know, it takes some investment. But the uh, you know, but the landlords that are that are doing it, and there's a ton out there that are doing it. Um, you know, they're they're reaping the benefits and they're staying ahead of the curve. 
So is there a, and I know this is probably a dumb question, so forgive me in advance. Uh, is there like a general kind of cost per square foot that these guys start to, you know, get squeamish on? Is it, is it, do you just quote it again, like a food hall, like, Hey, a stall will cost you X. Um, is it, is it all extremely case by case sensitive? I mean, how, is there like a rule of thumb with this stuff or, or is it, is it really nuanced? So I don't, I actually, I don't believe there's a rule of thumb. Um, what I always, I always look at is, is to say to someone, listen, this is what the market rent is, right? The market rent on this space, if you take it, you know, and, and remember, these are, these are people, a lot of times, you know, you know, the handholding and less sophisticated, less sophisticated uh, tenants. They don't, they don't want to know the square foot. How much is it going to cost me per month? What's my monthly nut? That's the only number that matters, right? So you can be like, oh, well, it's $32. No, no, no. It's $1,500 a month. It's $2,500 a month. And so I, what I like to say is I like to give them the number. They're like, okay, the asking rent on this space is $7,000 a month. So, so just understand because I, it's important for people to understand the value of the space that they're getting. Not to say that, yeah, I mean, you have to rent it to get that value, but you know, so if you come in and you're like, all right, the space was 7,000 or be, it was asking 7,000, you're going to get it for <clears throat> 3,500 a month. Oh, all right. Well, that's, that's half off what they were asking. You know, it starts to sound a little bit more attractive, but it's really a case by case basis. Um, how long has the space been vacant? What do you have to do to the space to get it ready? Um, you know, flexibility is the name of the game here for both the, the tenant and the landlord. So the landlord wants to reserve the right to, you know, the, the landlord, what the landlord always says to me is, well, we want to make sure if we get a permanent tenant that we can kick these people out. Yeah, of course, you know, that's no one's, no one's arguing that, but in order to get that flexibility, you're going to have to be flexible on the rent. You know, it, it, it's a two way street. So, um, and the tenant says, well, we don't know if we're going to do it. Okay. Well, you don't know. You have to pay for that flexibility that you can leave in six weeks, you know, and so you just, and this is really where I believe that, you know, my expertise and my understanding of what the landlord's looking for and, I, you know, how I speak fluent landlord and I understand how these brands operate and I can, you know, then I really, I put my broker hat back on and I make these deals and, um, you know, a lot, a lot more heavy lifting, I, you know, there's no doubt, but, um, but I really believe that ultimately it's, it's, you know, it's a win-win for everybody, and then it, then it could be a huge, a huge win if you know when things go right. Are, is there a like a term that you, that you found that people people can get their arms around? Is it is it six weeks? Is it ninety days? Is it you know what what do people what do these things normally look like? I assume that's very different if there is a build out, right? Like I like I assume if it's four walls and some racks, you can probably do it thirty days or sixty days. But um, does it get um, is there, is there a trend that you're seeing in, in these timing for, for these leases? Yeah. So, uh, to, to the, to one of your points, generally pop-ups, it's a second generation space. They're at, they're, they're generally as is deals for second generation space. Um, right, you so got your bathroom, landlord, you got your electrical panel, you got your white walls, you got HVAC, yeah, you want to plug and play. Yeah. You want to paint it? Yeah. Plug and play. You want to paint it? You paint it, but then paint it back white when you're done. You want to put up shelves, put up your own shelf, you know? So the landlord really has little investment. Now on certain deals, obviously, um, you know, that, that changes, but, but in terms of uh, the term, so I'm seeing a lot of pop-ups getting done around the holiday time. And that's generally a black Friday through Christmas kind of thing. Um, or sometimes we'll do like a summertime lease where it's like a, you know, May through, through August kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I think it's anywhere between 30 days um, on the feasibility study ones. On the, on let's test this concept to see if it's, a, if it's a concept. I think it's a three-month minimum to really test it out, you know, and I tell people that. Like, you're not going to learn a lot in two weeks. You know, you, you, you're, you're literally asking people to change shopping patterns. So you got to give them some time to walk by the store once, walk by the store twice, and then the third time they'll actually come in and visit, you know. Um, and, uh, so yeah, anywhere, but I, I mean, I've done pop-ups for two weeks, 
Um, now, again, those are gen- I, I think the shorter term pop ups, those are generally like they're not they're not designed to stay forever. Um, they're they're quick hits. They're money makers for the landlord. Um, and 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 they're 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 money makers for the landlord. And they're there's something to hang a marketing hat on. I did a uh, I, I, I'll never forget. I did a deal in, in Chicago where um, there's this little music festival called Lollapalooza. And, uh, and Lollapalooza, um, came to us and said, we want to open a pop-up store, not inside the festival, but outside the festival for people that want to buy all the stuff that we sell at Lollapalooza, but they don't want to go to the festival. So I'm one of those people. I, I would buy a t-shirt or a poster or something, but I don't really want to deal with the Lollapalooza madness. So, um, so they said, we want to do that. I said, okay, great. So I, I went to my boss and I said, Hey, uh, and, and by the way, Lollapalooza, quite possibly the coolest thing in the world, right? The coolest brand recognition, like everybody loves it. It's just a really cool thing. And so I've what been I listening knew to Jane's addiction guy, all day today, by the way, there you go. So, you know, Perry, um, by the way, side story, I saw Perry Farrell's bar mitzvah album, uh, but that's a totally story for another time. Um, so, um, so I knew as a marketing guy that if I could leverage the brand equity of Lollapalooza to say, Hey, look what we've got. We've got the Lollapalooza store that made us cool. That made the mall cool. And frankly, I was, it was a mall that needed to be cool at the time. And I knew that, and it didn't matter how much money they could pay or what I didn't think, you know, that wasn't important to me. Well, it was important to the bean counters that I worked for, you know, and when I went, I'll never forget, I went to my boss and I said, hey, I want to do a Lollapalooza pop-up store. And his response was, ah, it's like, that's like dirty kids. Like, yeah, I don't Damn know. Damn hippies. That's really gonna... And the right, music. Exactly. And I said, yeah, maybe. But do you know how much money it costs to go to Lollapalooza? <laughs> you know? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And I said, all right, well, they're going to pay us $12,000. He's like, oh, great. Let's do it. You know? And um, so... For him, and I get it, I, it's not a knock against him, I get, his, his mindset was, how do we generate revenue? And I was all about that. I love generating revenue with these things, but I also knew the leverage that we were going to get. And sure enough, we were the coolest spot in town for those two weeks, the Lollapalooza, and, and, and it, I think it actually set the mall on fire that I was at and allowed me to do tons of other things into the future. So there's a lot of different pieces to the Money, yes. But energy, you brought up energy is really important. And then, you know, leveraging off of another brand's equity, I think, is, a, is a, an underrated, you know, element to this whole thing. And, um, um, and I love doing that. That's a, that's a big piece of it for me. Well, Aaron, you, you've already been really, really generous with your time. I, I want to I get one more question in before we have to wrap it up. If you could kind of condense down our conversation for the last 30 or 45 minutes um, and just tell me what in your mind makes for a successful pop-up. Is there a sweet spot for type of merchandise, type of advertising, type of placement? Like what, and if you could really condense it down in your mind, what do you think makes for a successful pop-up? Yeah. Well, I, I, I will, I will start by saying this. Um, it doesn't work everywhere and it doesn't work for everyone. So not every, this is not going to work for every landlord. It's not panacea. Not, it's not, yeah, no, it's just not. Um, for, so for one, the type of property where a pop-up can work has to be high profile. It has to be well trafficked. And, and listen, obviously we can, like those properties are still leasing. Right. And so, there's got to be something about the property or a particular space at the property that might be troubled, that might, yeah, we, we've had really good success with all this stuff, but we just can't get this wing over here. Or we just, we need some, we need, need some a shot energy in the arm somewhere. Spot. Yeah. You need a shot in the arm. Great. Perfect. And so, so that's to me a, a, a perfect ripe opportunity for pop-up to come in and, um, and do a great job. And then, you know, as far as the type of pop-up, well, all right. You know, one of the things I love to look at is what's the marketing direction of the property? What, what direction are you looking to go? 
Who are you looking to appeal to? Oh, we really want millennials. I'm working with a property right now, you know, which is, um, you know, they're saying, hey, listen, we've been, we've been living in, in, and dying on the baby boomers for years, but we need to shift to the millennial customer because that's who's going to be shopping here for the next 30 years. Okay, well, that customer wants experiences. They'll trade stuff for experiences. So let's create a pop-up or look for pop-ups that have more of an experiential angle to them. And let's, and let's go source that. And by the way, if we have to buy it and bring it in and, and, and it's, you know, it's a real cheap deal, okay, but it's going to leverage that. We can leverage that to bring in other stuff. Remember, it's always, it's always about the, the, you know, the means to an end, and that's, to me, where, where pop-ups can really um, come into play. And I, I think it's a great model. And um, like I said, I think, I think there's a lot of landlords that are fully embracing it, and they are reaping the benefits right now. So. That's, I feel like I've, I've learned a ton and, and this has been, this has been a blast to just catch up and, and, um, shoot the shit about retail with you. Like we used to, uh, do me a favor, yeah. let everybody know how they can connect with you, how they can learn more about what you're doing, about what, uh, you know, what you can do in the pop-up space. If, whether it's social media, your website, LinkedIn, uh, email, let, let people know how they can connect with you. Yeah, cool. So, uh, so my company is Gadiel Group dot and it's Gadiel Group dot com. Um, Aaron at Gadiel Group dot com. LinkedIn is probably the, the, the you know certain email or LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch with me. Um, I work all across the country. I'm I'm in Houston right now. I'm in L.A. I'm based out of Chicago. Obviously, I've been in Charlotte and um, New York. Um, and so I work on the landlord side. I also work on the brand side. Um, and it's really about um, just digging in and understanding this, uh, this, this sort of shifting paradigm in this new world. And I, I, I'm a good translator when it comes to all that. I've, I've, I've been in the trenches on this stuff for a long time. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Adam Williams. This has been Retail Redeveloped. Sure appreciate everybody listening and, and learning about pop-ups just like I did. And, and this was a lot of fun, Aaron. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Adam.